Welcome. This is the June eleventh Jalen Zones production user call. We have Daniel, Dan, Jan, Antonig, and myself, Michael, and just some quick random news. Silverton BSD Con was great. Jamie and Levi both live in Silverton. Levi's been on some calls. Jamie is the jail maintainer, and we met for coffee yesterday. That was great, and we mildly trolled Antonig over Skype on the way down there. Thank you, Antonig, for joining us. And Let's since see. most of our viewers, according to YouTube, watch the first half, not the second half, this would be the appropriate time to say like and subscribe. Seventy-four percent of you do not; they have not subscribed. Thank you. Very good to know. Um, I did not get a photo of us having coffee, but it was good coffee. I had the mocha; he had the Mexican mocha. Uh, Jan, it sounds like you have an answer. I would love to do a simple disc acrobatic maneuver on first boot and everything i read about first boot says hey go install this package which could be rather dated uh, documentation um lib exec new age in it what am i looking at can you explain what that is jan if we still have you yeah it's basically um minimal partial implementation of the cloud in it uh, interface. It's just fairly restrictive. It does uh, the most important parts like IP configuration, DNS, uh, and it can run an arbitrary shell script. That's all I want is a shell script. So is that the exactly. path or uh, can I do something like that? That's your universal escape hatch. Okay. Uh, but I think you have to enable the service. So it's okay. not auto enabled. Um, but uh, check the RC.d script. It may auto enable it. It finds the right disk label because there are basically a few disk labels it can find. So you put the configuration on a, I think, FUT or ISO uh, file system. Okay. Well, uh, is there something simpler like a script in Splash that simply first run and it just gets run once and nuked? Or is that not a Yes, thing? Uh, but that you uh, have to configure too, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. So, uh, uh, Dan, there are various notions of first boot in so far as the system does something only once on the very first boot. And for the most part, I guess there's a Sentinel file, a little placeholder exactly. named first boot and root. But what happens after that, uh, I'm confused about insofar as most how, people say. How does that differ from a next boot? Uh, um, uh, go ahead. Because it, you, boot in order normally, to do for uh, next boot, you have to do you have to boot first. Yeah. So the next boot is normally uh, stored somewhere either at the file system or partition level, and not at the or pool level in the event, not uh, as a file inside the root file system because it potentially defines which is your file system is supposed to be mounted as a root file system. Whereas the uh, first boot sentinel basically takes care of, for example, it's used on the ARM images for Raspberry Pi to grow the partition table on first boot to fill the full file, uh, disk and then uh, grow the root file system. I'm sorry, first boot is a package? Uh, in no, the, my research, some of the... that's what every forum said, and I did, didn't seem right. Yes, no, there are some RC.t scripts tagged as for first boot and so they tap into that but some of the extra so convenient features are available for ports okay that makes a lot more sense but which is the first boot mechanism is implemented in rc.sabra and the partly in the rc etc rc uh, script itself okay so what that requires is a oh. multiple file system as root file system so that you can after you run through etcrc um delete it that empty fi file marking it as okay i uh, succeeded in my first boot yep. so there's no need to run that again because any uh, first boot setup will have put his own hooks in the system i don't know an uh, at reboot cron job running as a poll or whatever fancier thing you want maybe oh. a salt stack minion or whatever okay well i'll that, take a look thank that, you for those pointers that, go ahead on 
that's okay. also a bit weird for me. So wait, this is, okay. So let's say I'm deploying at scale and I'm deploying, let's say with, um, let's say I'm deploying with Beehive. In this case, would I use the installer image or the VM image and then also attach a FAT32 and a slash or an ISO disk. And then it reads from the disk. So there's a, so the huge image or graph S, graph S tab, Z prune, we UID and so on, are all um, packed with the first boot keyword. Ah. So, um, and what exactly that keyword means is defined in ETCRC. Um, so yeah, you have to check that. And the same um, file okay. defaults to slash first boot. Um, okay. The least invasive place to put that in, uh, any customization you want in would probably be the vendor's file, which is basically read after the defaults, but before all of the other rc.conf configuration. So this assumes uh, that I'm creating my own operating system image? Like this. No, this... It, uh, means that you put like five lines somewhere to uh, enable potentially dangerous automations because you know that they are what you want in your uh, environment. Because some of these things, for example, from the EC2 things will do an HTTP get from a um, IPv4 uh, locally assigned address and then uh, just uh, run arbitrary code it has fetched via HTTP. And it only does that because it knows that that's a dedicated Ethernet interface to the hypervisor, which is safe to use. That I also that's... understand. Uh, here's what I still and don't understand. Um... If you did that on your laptop, uh, any okay. coffee shop operator could uh, own your system. Anytime okay. you boot with in range of their Wi-Fi with it auto joining. Okay. Okay. So wait, wait. So uh, I I have a free BSD image, uh, the VM image specifically. I'm booting it up with Beehive. Okay. Now I wanted that as soon as it boots, use these specific IP addresses and let's say run PKG install. I don't know Tmux whatever. <clears throat> Based on what you said, I can use the first boot facility, but where do I put the scripts? That, that That's what I have didn't get. So, that's my um, original question, too. There are just very few base system rc.d scripts which make use of this first boot keyword. There's GrowFS, there's GrowFS S-Tab, there's okay. Zpool VGUID, uh, okay. there's Zpool Upgrade, and now in 14.1 there's this UH in it, or however you're supposed to uh, pronounce that. Which is a minimal oh, uh, cloud uh, in it. Uh -huh. That's but not available in 14. You also have uh, imports available uh, first boot cloud setup, first boot FreeBSD update, and first boot uh, PKGs. Mm -hmm. um, you also have, uh, which I find quite uh, useful, uh, hidden in the EC2 uh, scripts by Colin. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, config in it. The problem is that uh, in the last or second to last update, he replaced the um, fetch invocation with the magical IPv4 address and an option mm -hmm. to change the URL uh, via rcconf uh, with mm -hmm. a command which works with newer uh, instance types but is no longer usable outside of uh, Amazon's cloud infrastructure. So oh, now that's you need sad. your own rc.t script to just call that. It's like a five-line script does enough, or maybe 10 if you want comments. But still, it's annoying, and that's one of the reasons why I more or less finished a rewrite of uh, config in it in C so that it's also a lot faster uh, and can properly uh, change root and jail attach itself. Hmm. So that it becomes uh, really, really useful because now it can run on an empty change root directory. Anyhow, uh, yeah. that puts me at least in the right direction. I just want to run a script, and it's great to know there's a new facility there. So, yeah, that facility means you have to uh, 
create a FUD or CD9660 file system oh and okay. put it on a partition table with a GPT label of the right magic name. Okay. Okay. Yeah. See the D scripts for uh, more information on when it triggers. Hmm. That's good. That's perfect. This um, is actually very useful. Um, the, uh, and 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 is 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 the nuage in it uh, a script? It's a, uh, a FreeBSD Lua script. I, I get that too. But is it enabled by default? Or do I have to download the VM image, modify it, and then do... I think you, you know. have to create the first boot Sentinel file, uh, and then it okay. should auto enable But I haven't used it like that, so I would have to try myself. Got it. Okay, this is perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, now I got the answer. And the nice thing about it being basically a file system is that you don't have to deal with... Um, bundling stuff up mm -hmm. because you have a whole file system mm -hmm. uh, with um, the right extensions. An ISO file system can also contain permissions, user IDs, and so on. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, auto-enabled by mount or if you would have to change your CDD script to mount it and so on, but uh, it really works out of the box with a, in Beehive with um, just a raw file. So mm -hmm. you would, could use the tar command to create instead of a tar archive and yes, uh, ISO file system. Yes, or, um, yes. And I think MakeFS also supports FAT. I don't know if it supports ISO 6960. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, this this does uh, make a lot of sense. You must have never to, to do that in base because uh, if it doesn't, because... Um, Somehow the release process works. Yeah, <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if this could also be useful for jails. Yes, it can. Uh, except that you know, in this case, there's no separate file system, but well, maybe a be. path. You know, like MNT first be, boot uh, in the jail where it would like the jail. Oh, MNT well, first boot. I'm gonna go. If you allow the jail to mount, but that's risky and requires very careful yes. setup. Yes, yes, yes. Or that's what I'm saying. Or the better way to do it would be to just invoke that on a directory without ever mounting it. So you would have uh, just an rc.d script you inject to invoke the uh, mechanism without the mounting and use another FS the host mounts. Mm -hmm. So right. there's just an rc.d script missing. Uh, the logic in your unit shouldn't have to change. OK. Got How about no, we give this, this a no try and report back? I've got my I didn't use have a case. chance to test that yet. I just yours. stumbled over it and glanced at the code once I found it in the release notes. Okay, there's homework to be done. Let's report back. I have my use case. Antony, you have yours. Sounds fun. I'm testing it on Charlie right now. Right. I can see <laughs> it from here. Wait. Uh, so thank so you. It, so it, it could it, potentially it, be quite useful to have a way which does not rely on DHCP and its uh, BPF device and so on to do a VNet jail interface configuration dynamically. I just want to run a script. That's all. Anyway. <laughs> Understandable. Uh, you look for user dash data, I think, or user dot star data in the uh, file in libexec uh, about how to name the file. Okay. Love um, it. Cool. It just invokes os.execute and checks the return value. Okay. Uh, note os, I think, exactly. Um, what? How did you get the idea that you could use a tar file? Uh, I just heard those words. So maybe I misheard those. No, words. you could use tar to create an ISO file system. Ah, ah, use tar. Because BSD tar is just a wrapper around libarchive, and libarchive yep. can write file systems. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. And thank you, Jamie, for lovely time, a lovely time with coffee yesterday. So uh, I saw this on the Fediverse on this day. Sun patented the translucent file system for the granddaddy of overlay FS uh, for all these discussions about overlay file systems and union mounts and all that. There is a PDF and the, the patent. So have a nice day with that. Let's see, I can talk about my mad science a little later. Daniel, it sounds like you have NetGraph Buddy news. Yeah, so I gave a lightning talk at uh, BSD Can about um, just basically the, the idea was that, 
you know, don't be afraid of net, net, uh, net graph and that I find it to provide a sort of a calmer environment for, um, uh, for dealing with like large numbers of, of jails and VMs because you don't have to deal with the million tap devices and, you know, the, the couple D-pair devices and stuff like that. I find burying them uh, is a little bit nicer and I haven't had any performance problems. I think that, um, <clears throat> that the, even the theoretical performance problems probably aren't a big deal if you're using, you know, if, if something's using VNet anyway. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's, I, I think, I think that what I stumbled, what I stumbled upon is pretty, pretty nice for management. So I have a tool that's, that's agnostic of the, um, you know, it works, it works with basically jail conf and, and self-managed beehive or, or has a helper for VM beehive. Um, and it'll just help you manage bridges and, uh, create persistent devices and, um, uh, uh, yeah, it it just it just it's sort of a it's sort of a Unix Unixy in that it has a building block for just dealing with jail and um and uh, the uh, or, or sorry the the, the net graph bridges and stuff and then some other tool can deal with the the actual management. So what that what that turns out to be is I use net graph to set up my bridges. Um, I keep those consistent between failover hosts. And then I have sort of my own scripts that deal with just jail conf and and uh, and, and beehive. Um, so uh, anyway, getting uh, now that I now that I have that, I decided to because the I got some really good feedback from um, and and a good response from the lightning talk. So I got obsessed with it and I I polished it. So it now has a man page and. Um, it's just about ready for ports. I'm just doing some some final decision making about um, you know some some standards, uh, the last second changes to the name to make sure uh, you know everything kind of kind of lines up. Um, but yeah, it it I, I think that I think that it's a useful way to to sort of a free BSD user. They learned how to use a VM. They learned how to use a jail. The next day, they can use they can try NetGraph. Uh, to to see how uh, they they like that um, management versus versus IF bridge, um, so yeah, there, there it is. Um, so I'm using Pandoc for the README, and and my my trick is I just write the man page, and that's my README file, and that turns into uh, ngbuddy.8 for the man page. Um, nice. So it's it's fairly readable with an and example. Good work. Yeah, yeah. And there's uh, there, there's a, an example jail conf and DevFS rules. Um, I'd like to add some you know some some more stuff to that. It has a couple fun goodies like there's a status awk script that that creates like a really tidy. Um, here are the bridges that you've created, and here are the objects attached to it. And I mean, of course, you still have all the power of ng control. Ng control dot to create uh, to create cool maps, and I have something that does uh, Mermaid JS, which is a uh, you know an ugly but web friendly. Um, not not ugly as in, uh, I mean it makes pretty it makes pretty diagrams, but uh, ugly in that you have to import a bunch of JavaScript code into your site. But it's a very portable way to present little um, you know little diagrams of what's going on on the hosts. So yeah, so this, the 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 motivation for this was I use JailConf and I also use Beehive and a lot of the jail managed I guess IO IO Hive and IO Cage probably have a shared language for this, but I thought that having an agnostic language between the different um, you know the different systems uh, would be a would be an interesting building block to have. So we have a you know a NetGraph manager and then. The other the other tools could could use them, and VMB Hive already does work with them, and JailConf uh, works with them. So, you know, if other if I could adapt it to be like Bastille friendly, or uh, I think I think it would be pretty easy to make it jailer friendly. Um, that's that's something I'm definitely interested uh, interested in doing, and just make it a lot easier for everybody to use. Um, well, I mean, whatever. 
whatever networking they want to uh, want to do at all. Very cool. Any questions for ah, 14 hours ago? Any, any questions for Daniel? Uh, Eon, it's 17 million. Uh, I mean, oh, well, yeah, you could do the, the JIDs for the, the MAC addresses. I, I, I must say, I, 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 we, can, we can talk about this a little bit later, but I get collisions constantly. Um, so the, the way FreeBSD appears to do it, or at least the rumor is, it uses the, the, the code, UUID. Uh, so I can tell you what the uh, EPR driver does and what Beehive does in a slightly different way. So basically, the just... first 24 bits are fixed, and then it will use basically the interface uh, name and so on, or in the case of Beehive, the uh, VIT.io, uh, PCI ID, and so on, uh, to compute a very a hash over very few bits and then truncate the MD5 down uh, to 24 bits. So you have to expect real world Mac address collision when you use that on a non trivial deployment. Right. Um, Again, constantly. Yep. Yeah. Not Let's depending on what you do, that is to be expected, sadly. Uh, for example, if you so, have a virtual machine with the same config on different hosts, you will have a collision because it's the guest uh, name with Beehive and not the host name, which uh, is put in there, which kind of makes sense because when you migrate your Beehive VM to a different system by just copying it over while shut down, you kind of want to keep your MAC address, uh, but uh, yeah. So the only thing that scales is to just use, either if you are lucky enough to have your own block, <laughs> use that, or more realistic, you have almost 47 bits to play with of locally assigned ones. I think some of them are reserved, but oh, definitely over 40 bits. So you could just basically partition those bits between host bits and jail bits, and then or just use basically some kind of control plane to uh, globally assign, uh, or sidewide at least assign uh, static jail IDs to your jails. Uh, and if you start with uh, jail IDs over 1 million, you will never collide with the auto-generated uh, jail IDs in the kernel because the kernel will only auto-assign jail IDs up to 1 million. And when it has okay, exhausted okay, okay, this, okay. it will okay. scan and again. Multiply that, by, multiply that by 20 hosts and you, know, you, you're, you still need a randomizer to exactly. create the jail ID. Right. So yes. So basically, my that all you need a state for control plane, right? So I have a like so I have an like option. Yes, yeah, so I have an option for to CD, uh, any kind of multi master uh, consensus based key value store. It could even be something like where does if you have the clustering set up and persistence uh, configured correctly. Yeah, I mean, if somebody's getting oh, to let's that see point, how NetGraph buddy yeah, handles it. If they, if if they, yeah, if if somebody, if it's getting to, if it's getting to that point, then you're right. You need you need your own MAC address um, handler, and you probably know enough about networking that you don't need such a thing. But huh. what ne what ne NetGraph Buddy allows is for you to assign a assign a prefix and then create a seed based on the interface name. Sure. So if you wanted to have a fit failover fail over host environment, you would keep the same MAC, or you could specify your own seed. Um, along with the um, the name, so that way, let him talk. You can use the basic. You can use the basic FreeBSD uh, pre uh, three letter prefix, or you could use zero two, which is the self uh, the internal assignment prefix, because we're not actually selling jails to anybody, so it's probably no big deal to use the zero two prefix. In which case, you've now added another uh, you know many orders orders of magnitude to the number of MAC addresses you have. So that gives the user. Tons of flexibility, though. Jan, you're right. I mean, if you if you, I mean, if you're designing your own system, you probably don't need NetGraph Buddy. You probably don't need a jail, uh, um, you know, a jail or VM controller or or anything else. But I think that I've provided can... flexibility for small offices with several billion um, devices. <laughs> several billion devices in a small office, right? Uh, joking aside, uh, you can avoid the whole mess of dealing with MAC addresses 
if you uh, go from layer two to layer three and use a routed network. But if I uh, understand the command line examples, uh, netgraph body uh, doesn't handle that. It assumes there's a bridge, right? That's that's incorrect. It, it will choose by default, it will assume it will create one of each. It'll create a, uh, a address associated with the default route, which was your original recommendation. And then it will also create a private bridge. So you have your, your choice of using a layer uh, two or layer three option. No, of course, you can, fully config, you can fully configure the number of bridges you have and what configurations they have. And even it works multi-tiered. So you don't, you could even have a, uh, you can even have multiple, multiple layers. Netcraft does a great um, job with that without even thinking about it. You can use Netgraph to create a pair of layer three tunnel, uh, sorry, layer three point to point interfaces connected with each other. Give one to a VNet enabled jail and thereby you have a layer three uh, point to point interface without any bridge and the host is a router. This avoids dealing with all of the MAC addresses and when scaling up has the big advantage that your uh, top of rack switches don't have to learn a MAC address for every jail. Hmm. Instead, you can use routing and as long as you keep any semblance of structure, even if you occasionally move jails, but as long as you kind of get to aggregate, you can keep, really keep the number of routes low because you would assign, let's say, a slash 24 to each host, IPv4, uh, at least one slash 64, maybe a slash 56 to each host. And then um, you could just delegate those. Uh, yep. and, Jan, and you've, any you've overrides touched... you need as host routes in your uh, IGP routing protocol, be that OSPF, Bubble, yep. eGRP, whatever uh, poison you pick. Yeah, I think uh, we're... I think You've identified totally a dedicated too. topic. There should be a meeting on just all that handling because it comes up quite frequently. So let's you know, so, uh, to bring this uh, back, to bring this back notes. to earth. To bring this back to earth, the the model is the same as you know VirtualBox and VMware and so on. You have uh, by default it creates a a quote unquote bridge, a bridged interface, which is which goes to wherever your default route is, the physical interface. And then a private or host only interface for which you could have, uh, you know, as many as FreeBSD allows, uh, with with or without the help of NetGraph Buddy. So, so that's the that's the idea. Is this is that I wanted something that basically creates the concepts that that VirtualBox and other, uh, well, all basically all uh, commercial hypervisors uh, provide except use them flexibly for jail or Beehive or any other VM system, et cetera. But, Thank you, Daniel. While a private point, bridge yeah. is its own MAC address collision domain, it is still a bridge. So it's a, not a pure layer free network. Okay, so future still topic. So it's still an Yep. You're pushing around. Love it, future topic, still because a MAC address. it keeps coming up. Understood. I, and that definitely needs some... Uh, uh clarification for the masses so i love the topic but uh now is not the time uh that said let's see dch do you have any news i know you've been working on with various folks on a nifty die jenkins die project uh no no trekking along I, i've um um where am i at this week uh so my elixir version is now ahead of my c version and I'm bringing the C version up to speed. Um, and currently I'm doing the bit where it, um, it's cloned the repo and it's looking inside the repo to find the uh, the classic YAML UC, um, or UCL type file that explains what next steps it needs to take. And uh, that's quite quite exciting because after this, this is the, um, for want of a better word, the sort of the, the federated piece after this where the agent sends back to the server um, we have three more steps, distribute them as you like, uh, and then the server goes off to um, assign suitable boxes. Yeah, so truck it along, cool. and uh, it's uh, it's good fun. Um, I think I've the UCL stuff is just a bit past my competence in C. Um, it's pretty low competence. You know, the bar's pretty low, sort of down here somewhere. Um, 
Well, it's good fun. It's, it's ch- tracking along. High hopes for uh, uh, a, a big reveal at Euro BST Con, maybe even before that. Okay. Uh, Chris M's uh, VM State D has UCL support that might have some C code you can look at to. Yeah, I'm reading the C code no and, it, and it's not making sense. <laughs> okay. Uh, feel free to reach out individually, maybe even. I, will do, yeah. I, I should, I should have asked Chris because he's literally in the same city as me. This um, is true. And, so, um, Jan sent me some stuff last week as well, which is very helpful. Cool. Yes, the power of local coffee. Uh, before we dive into Antrenig's IPv6 adventure, which I think might get into debugging, we may want to kick that down. Jamie, do you have any news or topics? It was so good to see you yesterday. Oh, you know me. No news. Ah, no worries. Uh, I understand you're plugging away at the jail descriptors. Godspeed. Um, Antrenig, I'll just throw this out. It'll be quick. Uh, to whom it may concern, I'm messing around with package base and Occam BSD at the same time to see where they sort of intersect and collide. I was surprised that if you use sources from, say, 15 on a 14.1 host, you get all these warnings about OS versions where I thought the build system would be kind of aware of what's building what. So I will worry um, separately about that unless you have a super quick point, Jan. That's... Uh, if you're building 14 uh, uh, on a 14 host, the 15 system, yeah, that's to be expected. It should still do the right thing. The warning means just that you are instructing package to work on a 3BSD version, which has a different uh, ABI from its own. You can set yep. the uh, ABI uh, environment variable to overwrite that. Okay, that's a good answer, uh, and I see these are recommendations. Uh, heard, and so. you have to do that if you want to do an upgrade from 14 to 15, for example, or oh. if you have your own repositories from 13 to 14. Okay. By the way, uh, the official mirrors have finally caught up, so we now have official 14.0 uh, packages. You know, longer have to build your own. So 14.1 is caught up? Yeah. Great. It took a while because the, yeah, it wasn't really prioritized and normally very helpful, but um, Prudia has some logic in where uh, and um, reproducible builds harder in that case because it says, oh no, this is a reproducible build. It has a new version number, but all the sources are identical. The outputs are bitwise identical, so no new package. Oh, interesting. For you. Uh, and that's totally confusing in that case. Okay. So, um, Colin wiped that, and uh, now we have designated so for a f- new release for a router or bug fix yep. security update and so on. It makes sense, but not for a new dot release. Got it. Thank you. Um, that said, I am experimenting with a a minimal base, and then I'm adding a build option, so it'd be essentially be with man. And I did see that the results of the log, at least, which is my first smoke test metric, are significantly different. Here's my largest log file of the output. Here's my smallest. So it is doing stuff. My fear was that somehow make packages was not resp- respecting source.conf, but it is quite dramatically. So yay, I will keep you posted. Antrenig, you have a new IP address, you're saying? Hopefully a handful? Yes. What you got? Um, well, a- According to my ISP, they are giving me a slash 56, uh, which is good. And I do have, can I share the screen, if that's okay? Sure. Okay. Uh, I have no idea how to do this. One sec. Uh, desktop. Yeah, here's the desktop. Okay. Boom. And here are, okay. Netgraph, buddy. Okay. How's my machine? How's my font? Beautiful. Love it. Okay, great. One so, step larger would probably go- be good for the recording. He there we go. This, no, he pointed out the, that people the don't font watch size on the recording, not for window size. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, so here we go. So I did get an IP address, which is not bad. Uh, for those who wonder in the future, this is what the HCP CD looks like. Uh, IPv6 only. I keep doing IPv4 DHCP with 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 FreeBSD's DH client. Uh, well, basically, I copied a lot of stuff from Jan's uh, servers. Let's see, here we have 
um, don't do router solicitation by default. And on IGB-1, which is my WAN, I do router solicitation. I, as, I ask for a normal address and I do prefix delegation for another interface. This is IGB-2. That's my LAN, which is how it's supposed to work. And if I do, let's do a stop first. We can see that IGB-0, here it is. IGB-2, here it is. And if I do a start, the, it tells me that I got an IP address. Uh, for some reason, yeah, my can we just ISP... Yes? And, and go a couple of pages and explain what those couple of entries are. So if, you, um, if you're in a TMUX, oh. you should be able to just do that. Uh, sure. In the, in, the, in, the, in the config file, yeah. Oh, yes. So in the config file, here's a... Oopsie. Uh, here's a... Oh, uh, here's a local ETC DHCP... I hate this. DHCPCD.com. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Just yeah. like um, so yeah. this, this bit down the bottom, these, um, yes. no router solicitation that makes sense. Um, so what we're saying is don't ask for it. Have I understood that correctly? Globally, specifically. Yeah. Globally, so yeah. All interfaces don't ask for it, but on specific ones where we do want it, we will enable it. And then down the bottom, we have this... Um, the, the WAN interface, lines, which is worth explaining just briefly what they do. The IGB yes. Setup. So IGB2, it's monitored by DHCP CD, but it doesn't modify anything at that part of the config. In the bottom on IGB1, my WAN, it, and this was from Michael's home, sorry, let's do it that way. Okay. Uh, it, it does the router solicitation. It asks for a normal address, so just yes, a so single is, address. Okay. So this is enabling unicast. we masked out before, didn't we? IPv6 RS is saying, okay, we, we disabled it globally, but now we're enabling it specifically on this interface. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. then we do a prefix delegation for IGB2. So it will ask for another network, and it will assign it on the IGB2 interface, which is my LAN. And okay. hopefully so when everything line... works... You can so use RTADVD. So sorry, the, the middle line, the NA, is just saying, I need an address, but just for this specific interface and just one, yes. please. Yes. Yeah. And, and the one is a, uh, is, a, is, a, is an identifier number. So like if I want a third one, I would do IAPD, let's say, three, one, two, three. Yeah. And this one would be, let's say, a VM uh, bridge, for example, slash... Uh, Jan here, it would be slash zero or slash one. Because uh, the zero question. was for, uh, the zero was for IGB two. Here it would be. I slash... don't know it off the top of my head. I would have to read the main page just like you. Yeah. Uh, IAPD. They do have an example. Yes, the, those are also you know they, they go they go incrementally. So this would be a one. So mm -hmm. the zero is for IGB2, the one is for VM bridge. Mm -hmm. and th this would be the overall process here. Um, yeah, so you it would be this way. You could assign that to jails, couldn't you? You'd have to have a cloned interface and then assign it to a jail. Um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, you can you can uh, ask for multiple addresses. That, that, that would work too. Um, In that case, I think it would be something like um, normal address here. And then you would do something, if I remove this one, it would be IANA3, and it would assign it on IGB. You IGB3. don't have to do that. You don't have to do that? No, you don't. I think you can say just, okay, I now have a prefix. I want to fill out basically an alias IP with only the host bits. Where take the, the first... Uh, global unicast prefix you have and just fill out the lower 64 bits. Yeah, well, you can also do something like this. You can do IAPD3 dash. So you will get an IP address and it will not be assigned to any interface. You can do whatever you want with it. It will be printed your in your room. Script. Or, or you can use your own hook scripts, yes. It will be assigned mm -hmm. into your uh, leases file and you can read from there if you want. Uh, that would also be... And in that case, your host and your jails vms whatever right uh, that is not assigned um, it they would be on separate uh slash 64s i th think if the isp is doing things correctly yeah so this is my basic setup and after you run it you will get this 
which says um, activating for delegate. Wait, I think before that. Yeah, nope. Just, just yeah. Router advertisement from, and this is a link local address. It doesn't have to be correct. globally unicast. Um, it 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 pushed the following IP address to my um, IGB one to my WAN, and it also gave me an FC address. I don't know why they don't need to, but they um, did. It's probably so that they have basically a dedicated management address which is intentionally not globally routable on the van side of their CPEs. So yes. the, something they can use for whatever crappy remote management protocol yep. they use for the default routers. Yep. They don't want that hanging on a global IP address only protected by hopefully correct firewalls. It's easier to just make sure it's not globally routable. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and then it adds a route. It adds a route for the two of the addresses, the two of the did, subnets of the did addresses. Did you stop the demon or is it mm -hmm. still running? And it just no, it's detached? still running. It's, it's still running and just detached. Yeah. Uh, I, I did use service, by the way, to be specific. So I'm not That's doing fine. running um, it manually. Yeah. And then it adds a, a default is... route over the uh, router, which is the same thing. And then it goes into um, it goes into the next network, which is IGB two. It adds an address to it, which is this one. Uh, my IGB two got the, the column column one, the first IP address, and yeah. uh, that's pretty much it, right? So now all of the IPs are um, assi assigned. The problem with my ISP is, dear Ucom Armenia, you are dumb is that <laughs> they did not configure the rest of it. So if I do something Are like this- Are you sure this, about that? Let yes. it finish. This is what happens. It goes to my gateway, and from my gateway's gateway, it doesn't go anywhere. So it just doesn't oh, go- A it's, few ideas. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, just to you know confirm with all of you that this is actually the ISP's problem. Here, I am going to connect to our data center. See, this machine is in Amsterdam. Uh, and here, if I do MTR to my address, which is, where is my address? There, nope. IGB1. Here is my address. You would see that Wait my is waiting. I couldn't read that fast. Uh, what's your, okay. Uh, your, um, okay, yep. it looks like IPv6 is not disabled. Okay. Yeah, and if I do something like this, you would see that it gets to, this is one of the BGP endpoints of my uh, stupid uh, ISP, UCOM. I, I have to specify, like they're very, very stupid. Uh, yeah, so this, this is one of their machines. This machine actually has like 10 different IPv6 addresses. The seven is with uh, Sofia. The five is with um, uh, Ros Telecom Armenia. The three is with the Amnec community, the ISOC community of Armenia. It's, it's a BGP endpoint, basically. Um, sorry, a BGP, um, uh, what do you call it? A peer, yeah. And from there it should distribute, but it's not distributing. So they do have a problem in their system. Uh, so yeah, and this has been going for uh, 24 hours now. They started with assigning an IP address that was not routable, the just the F FC address. I didn't get a 2000 address in the beginning at all. Uh, but uh, now they fixed that. And then I, I I texted them back saying, hey, you were giving me an address, but you have a problem in your core infrastructure. And uh, their response um, to that was, uh, well, we're not supporting IPv6 at the moment, so we can't help you with anything. Like, you know, this is the best that we can do. This is the best that UCOM can do. There you go. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. So can you show us your hosts, your router, home routers, uh, IPv6 routing table? Yes, uh, RN6, there you go. So you do have a default route. Can you ping your default router? Yes, I can. Ping six or ping, it doesn't matter. Yes, I can. My gateway's okay. gateway is the problem, by the way, according no, to I, I, MTR. I it could be that, so now, um, if you uh, ping, which is your source? Uh, if you ping six, what's your source IP? If I ping six, my source IP is this. Yeah, if, if, you, if you ping its global address. If I ping, whose global address? 
your first hops? My wait, what? Go again. Uh, try to ping the FF02 colon colon two address on that interface. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. That's your all routers on link. Yes. So that's one, which is all of the machines. Your... And then there's two, which is all of the routers. I get a response from... Is your system <laughs> configured to be a router? Uh, is my system configured to be a router? Sys, uh, CTL, wrap forward. Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. So, um, and... You're sure they're not claiming the colon colon zero host ID on the interfaces for themselves? The FF02 colon colon two? No, uh, the, it's not uncommon for infrastructure people to find it tempting to take a well known uh, host ID and uh, link local address for the default ah, gateway. I see what you mean. I see what so you they mean. could have. Put the uh, F E A T colon colon one uh, on their equipment. I see. I see. I do wonder. I mean, I I can do something like this. I also have F E A T colon colon one on my network, which is L O zero. That's an interface scoped address. It's a link. Ah, address. of course. Yeah, so of course, the person yes. L O zero. He finds this a scope to the loopback interface. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. So yes. What will the group so, find most useful in this? Um, I well, know if it worked, if it all... worked, it yeah. it would have been because well, one of the things that I want to do is to use a um, ULA address inside my network, a mm -hmm. uh, unique local address inside my network for. Things such as DHCP, that would be a good idea. Here I am running, I think I'm running PicRef LF name D. Yes, I am, uh, which is currently using only IPv4. I would like it to use IPv6 as well. Uh, that's one very interesting thing to have. And also um, I would like to configure RTA DVD, which is router advertisement daemon. Yeah. Now that one is configured properly in Michael's house. Uh, SSH 10101. Uh, and you know, trust is when you give someone else the root password, I guess. Uh, this is in Michael's house, and in he oh, sorry, the wrong path. And here, the RTA DVD conf should look like this. So, we're broadcasting the IGB1 network, uh, we're broadcasting a DNS only, right? The only thing we're broadcasting. Statically no. is the DN no statically is only the DNS and then dynamically it just gets whatever address is on here and it broadcasts that too. So in this case it's this network. We are multicasting uh, to a well-known group, not broadcasting. Yes. Oh sorry, multicasting. Yeah. So um in that case, so for example, the jails in Michael's house and the VMs and the physical machines, they all have an IP address from this network. And they get a, D8, uh, a, D, a DNS server of this IP address. So, you know, it, it works proper, properly. Uh, I would like to have that in my house as well. But um, I'll, 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 I'll ping my ISP and, um, well, so, not, not, um, the, not the support call. I think I should just like, send an email at this point because I, I keep telling yeah. them, like, hey, should I specify a, a, a exact prefix that I want, maybe with a slash... 64 or a slash 48 and their response was well we only provide slash 24 i'm like yeah but that's ipv4 dumbass i'm asking about ipv6 like it's 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 that much uh, i um, okay. guess the same problem um, exists in europe anyway yeah go on yeah just ask them to uh tell you which slash uh 24 ipv6 pa space they assigned you and yeah that's probably not going to work out well for you but it could be that they have some kind of annoying uh, access control, for example, that you have to use a UI64 address for, uh, derived from some MAC address they expect as a kind of access control. I see. Um, uh, or just that they have some kind of routing issue. And here what you can do is you start TCP dump uh, with ICMP6 ah, uh, filtering yes. on both sides. 
of here, the here, interfaces here. and then start the ping and see if traffic flows at least in one direction. It does. Yes, it does. <laughs> Good uh, observation. And yes, it does. Okay, so let's try that again. So here is so you my have end to end traffic flow in one direction. Yes. So I think V6 itself. Uh, yep, yep. Let all IPv6, just... or it's going to be very noisy. Okay, so here is, uh, let's just change this to ICMP6, ICMP6. Okay, so here is, you know, some traffic flowing, I guess. I have no idea what this traffic, okay, is neighbor advertisement and stuff like that. And if I do a ping from my server in Amsterdam to my house, which is this one, okay, and we'll do a single one so we don't go nuts okay and uh, here we go come on we were able to do this like a second ago well an hour ago maybe they changed something oh there we go so there you go i i i Wait should a second be... uh, what's the source address is that the source address from amsterdam the source address from amsterdam it ends with uh let's see what is that seven six three zero which is right here Seven six three zero, uh, and what I get is uh, the the packet arrives to my house, but when it tries to leave my house, it it just doesn't go back. So th they have so definitely misconfigured be a something. a unicast uh, route filter which is not populated for IPv six. Mm -hmm. so yeah, another idea an is ISP if they're not completely negligent want to prevent you from spoofing traffic from a prefix which they haven't uh, delegated to you. Yeah. And yeah. What you could also so, try is to uh, use ping six to specify the source IP and try a source IP from uh, the delegated prefix. Maybe they put that in. And I, it's just that. I, I can try. I mean, here's IGB2. What? Sorry, the wrong server. Here is IGB2. And okay. then you will specify its uh, global unicast address. Specify as... that ping 6 dash S capital, I think. Yes. ESDAM and still nothing. Still but nothing. Does I can the also traffic do it... arrive or not? Uh, we can do it with what this one as well. Uh, help. Uh, Address that's with the dash a capital, so dash a not dash a small to bsdam invalid local address. What? How did that happen? Is the interface I mean, down? I don't think so. IGB2 is that it's up. I, I, I can talk with you right now. So, <laughs> uh, did I copy the wrong address? I can ping myself, obviously. Other hot topics while you diagnose that. Uh, um, although I trust people would drop off organically if you do not want to hear some nifty diagnostics tips. So. No, this yeah, is super know. interesting. I, I've never really you got... You have to uh, configure the yeah, interface literally. name there, like IGB1. I guess. Uh, and then I IGB1 dash A address PSDAM. Invalid local address. I have no idea why I've never done this. I'm sorry. I can do it with ping. ping uh, do you, have, dash... do, um, you probably have to set the dash 6 flag, maybe. With MTR? It could uh, be me. Could be, could be. You're right. Oh, you were right. Yes. Okay. So now it's sending it to uh, BSDAM. Okay, let's go to BSDAM. Wait, there's a no route. There's still no route. Same it's... issue. Same gateway. Same machine. This same is not to be upstream. No route, I should tell you that yeah. that it gets an ICMP error message. It has no route, right? Well, well, yeah, but that, that is the message. It's no route to host. Like if I do a, an old school trace route, you would see, oh, no, sorry, not that one. You would see that I get, come on. It usually yes. used, it used to response with you no know, bang N, which means no route. But I guess they changed something since yesterday. And it would probably just get stuck here. 
I can just put with this guy. Yeah, and if we do go to the other machine, which is also FreeBSD, I guess I don't have non FreeBSD machines anymore. TCP dump dash n dash s0 dash gif0. It's a tunnel ICMP6. It doesn't arrive to me. I can try pinging it to see what how that works. It's this address. Also not or MTR in it. And it, it 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 always gets stuck at the same machine. Yeah, so they, they definitely messed up something in their network. Yeah, it's definitely upstream. It's definitely upstream. Daniel's right. There you but go. yeah, that's that's my uh, overall experiment there. I'll wait until they fix it, or if they don't fix it, then I'll file a complaint, as they say. Um, destroy um, them all. Destroy them all, it yes. Be, it should be working Yeah, now. that reminds me of uh, my unappreciated recommendation uh how to solve uh, uh, networking and security issues of the campus network, or else to call an all hands meeting, lock the doors, and burn down the building. Because it was that bad. After they had and... been completely rooted for two months, the idea was to just uh, manually go over the authorized key files they knew about. Hmm. A month later, they found a backdoor in the web mailer, then okay. one Can't here, and then that war there. And yep. Why do we keep time. it fine? Yeah. So. Dan, what you got? Antoneg, I feel your pain. I, I, I have tried several times to get my PF Sense box to do IPv6, which I'm sure I, Verizon is supplying now. And each time, <laughs> it basically takes me off the internet. So... Yeah, it, it, this this is very I mean shameful on the ISP part because and the the reason why I'm very 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 angry is because Ripe had a training two months ago in Armenia for ISPs like they invited me because I I'm just close friends with Ripe and uh, this operator did not come like ah. that just did not join the, and the other operators who came they were like wow this is really cool stuff with IPv6 and now they started integrating one by one even like it's been just three months after the training. Uh, but for anyone else who like doesn't know IPv6, it's like, oh, okay, IPv6 is, is a problem. Or, like IPv6 is not the problem. The ISP is the problem, or like the network setup, or in, sometimes even PFSense. PFSense does have some setup issues. It, it, it's very hard to debug IPv6 on even on OpenSense. Remember, Michael, we tried to configure it on your yep. uh, OpenSense, and it, and it took us a week. And then with nonsense. Your new pure free BSD router. Yep. It took us like ten minutes to, to yep. configure it and to get it up and running. Yeah, it's 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 very much sad. Uh, and it's still uh, another big part of the question is if I do get the IP addresses, are they filtered or not? Because many 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 ISPs, especially in the US, uh, they don't allow end to end connection inbound. To be more really? specific, like can mm -hmm. I run a jail in my house with IPv6? Where Michael can just put the IP and get access to it without well, doing on any a reasonable quality uh, endpoint. Your uh, CPE router, you should be able to specify on a basically per DHCP v6 prefix delegation client level uh, if uh, incoming traffic should be uh, statefully filtered or just forwarded at the yeah. very minimum. If the ISP uh, is not doing anything weird, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. it should be very easy. To, yeah. I do have a question though. So um, now that we have package base and bundling FreeBSD has become much easier. I remember back in the day on FreeBSD 11, how hard it was compared to the release tools now. Uh, does it make sense to have a, a custom operating system? Like, I don't know. I want to call it grid OS because that's what Sun used to call their cloud. They didn't call it a cloud. They called it the grid. Uh, I, maybe, it's a, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's a Tron reference. I don't know. But like something like that, where it's free BSD with everything that we need inside of it, and the everything being is um, PF, uh, VMB Hive, NetGraph Buddy, Jailer, um, a jail template that's made out of OCAM that doesn't have unnecessary things. Well, and you need uh, that, and some of us might need that, but it's a framework that matters to everyone. So yes, I, I'd say the tools are somewhat here already, and uh, just the fact that you Maybe can build just... an install without Clang 
or a Clang package means you get a small install with you know half the, all the hard heavy uh, done for you. But go ahead. Something like router BSD, but designated for a hypervisor. Uh, uh, my question would right, be a meta a meta port for a uh, you know a drop, like drop in yeah. least box yeah. something uh, like that. That would that would be I think that would be really effective because like VMB Hive, Jailer, and some other some other tools. I mean, would be so no you brainers. Can do that. But my question, maybe a bit theoretical, would be why bother trimming the base system? Just install it. The three gigs or so of storage is cheap, and you never know when it will come in helpful. Just don't instantiate it for each. Uh, don't deep copy it for every jail. Uh, oh, okay. The machine, and you're fine. If you only keep maybe one for the host and one for each uh, base uh, system for your customizations, uh, so that's where the mechanism of like the only base is your friend because uh, copying is a shot in the dark and, over time. Sorry? Uh, copying is a shot in the dark over time as things change, such that the package based mechanism is definitely something we want to fr frame that and allow no. FreeBSD 17 to act predictably. So maybe. Uh, I would absolutely agree. Here's a question, dude. Um, can package-based support metaports? Can you have just sort of, you know, my my minimum uh, set that just grabs a bunch of base ports? That Of course, you can have a yes. package which only consists of dependencies. Okay. You don't even need a, uh, uh, you don't even need a port for it. You can just have a manifest for it and then run package create. And we uh, shared, had an example of that I shared in the minutes several weeks ago. Can uh, it be cross repo? Great. I know it sounds stupid, but can yes. it be cross repo? Yes. Okay. So, like, I can have so a you meta for it. can even be outside of any repository, the meta package, and just package uh, install dot slash or package add dot slash. So I, I can have a meta port called the grid, which will install it, network. Not a port. It would at that point be just a package when you install it. The port is one way to get to a package. No, no, no. What, what, what I mean by a it's meta port, I mean, okay. I mean that someone can do PKG install grid and they would That's automatically get, yes. Uh, and not they would port. get, Okay. Yes. yes. Support is what you compile. We understand. Yeah. We get that. Yes. Yeah. Let the guy talk. <laughs> but uh, PKG is all grid, and would, they would get um, uh, what's his name? They would get uh, Jailer, NetGraph, Buddy, uh, VMB Hive, and all of the tools that we need, and then uh, something like package install grid jail. The, whose dependencies are the exact dependencies from package base. That's that's what yes. I meant by cross uh, cross repo, yes, right? But these so, dependencies are resolved within the repository. I think at mm -hmm. least that's how it's documented. But mm -hmm. if that's impossible because it doesn't exist, it will ch check in other repositories, hopefully by order of priority. What is That's annoying perfect. is that right now the um, support to manually specify a disabled repository is not usable. Mm -hmm. So if you disable repository, the main page says if you specify a disabled repository on the CLI, it should Or I can work. specify a config file, right? Or I can just uh, specify... That, you, know, the... yeah, you know, without even having to enable it so that you can have a disabled one just there so that you can manually specify it, but it's never accidentally used. Um, so certainly there is a bug report for uh, libpkg, so that doesn't work right now. It has been broken, I think, in 1.20. Link, um, link, 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 link. Uh, the GitHub issues of libpkg, I don't have the link. Okay, fine, handy. fine, fine, fine. Okay. And the workaround is to use priorities and keep them enabled um, or to use a repository directory uh, parameter to uh, just switch which uh, directory contains your repository configuration files. 
both can work. It depends on your workflow, which one is less annoying to use. Okay. Um, that's that's amazing. That's that's amazing. That could be uh, and, multiple meta packages that we can yep. use for all of the things that we need. It's exactly. Um, you can have um, something like Antronic's favorite base, uh, and you just uh, package install that, and it pulls in a user land. That's perfect. That's absolutely And perfect. you can okay. even have your own sets for things like the debug files to go with the packages you want to install. So that if you install package, install Antronic debug, uh, all the symbol files are Ooh. installed. Or the okay. tool chain. And then the full set can be just one package uh, delete and package auto remove away. And you have your old system more or less. Yeah. Works. Cool. Anything else? Bring Sounds it on. Good. That's yeah. I'll keep doing my science. Antrenig, we can maybe overlap and meet in the middle on some of that. Um, eighteenth. Go to. So, but my question would really be: Is it useful anymore to uh, strip down the base system as far as Ockham BSD because? The problem there is that suddenly uh, more complex ports will break in interesting, potentially non-obvious ways. For example, if you're lacking local files and you want to create a database with a certain language collocation. Yep. Oh, no Not question. that, though. Not that, though. Like, here's a good example. The, the, the chances that you need WPA supplicant and host AP, a, ADPD APD in a jail is like one in a million. Okay, fine, one one in 10,000, right? So like, I would like um, to have as a slim as possible. Case, you either need it or you don't. Right, and by definition, removing things from the OS will remove things from the OS. And some people get really hung up on that. But otherwise, if you're putting a satellite into space that doesn't need IPv4 networking, you can remove IPv4 networking and know that doesn't help you watch YouTube. So don't worry about it. People what will do what they do. Let's give them the tools. Hosting workloads. What, Great. That's a different use it's case. It's a cost uh, question. What is more important, saving file system space or saving uh, time debugging the minute? Right. No, if you're no, building no, no. FTP you work file payloads that are really tiny, it's your problem. If you're doing Arduino, it's your problem. If it's not your problem, it's not your problem. Don't worry about it. Don't lose sleep over it. Please, I beg of you. It, this is the, the whole point of BSD is giving the user to do whatever they want. Of course, uh, you're free to do it. I'm just, I'm not saying you shouldn't be able to. I'm wondering if that's. Yes, that's they will call you for help debugging right it. That is true. Yes, Jan, you are concerned that rightfully concerned that we will all ask because you pod maintainers will really hate you if you waste their time by telling them this port doesn't work for me, and then five days later uh, you mention, oh, by the way, I stripped down my user land to yes, the no minimum, question. and Let's all of say, these I can add more warnings uh, to unavailable. BSD. Sure, no worries. I will warn people that if they remove something, they by definition remove something and it may break. You get to keep both halves. Yes. However, okay. that, yeah. other points. Jamie, Daniel, Dan, Dave, Antrenate. I want to get into a fight with everybody about using yes. DHCP6 instead of Slack, but we don't have to do that now. I think we did not. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I use, I use, I use Slack. Slack. Configuration or stateful? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I guess you could leak. You could leak it's some information like Mac Mac information theoretically to outside people. I use Slack, but I don't. I mean, but there's a there's security feature for that. Wait, um, nobody I, I had... to use EUI sixty four uh, to derive your host ID part. Right, right. That's right. Yeah, I, I can use yeah, I have... stable uh, privacy extension. All studies where you take I don't, depends on your use case. For a server, you probably want it really stable, so you may just use a hash of a Mac address or something, or of a host ID or whatever. Or you may just don't care and think it's useful on the server. But when 
configured MAC address is embedded in there because then you can, if you know the MAC address, derive the uh, not just the link local address, but the global unicast address, which is really useful. You may just want to change your MAC address first to a locally right. assigned one instead of leaking your vendor one. Right. I, I mean, I'm only mentioning it because... Yeah, the just I, I just had it. Has its use a lot cases, of... uh, especially for providing additional information uh, to certain operating systems like DNS resolvers, oh. NTP servers. Okay. Uh, yeah, speaking jails, servers jails, jails, TFTP, jails, 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 or HTTP boot options. Putting you in jails, 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 jails. Sorry, I, I thought that was, I thought... that was my fault. No worries. <laughs> It's but, okay. I, I totally forgot. I, I did what uh, Jan recommended two weeks ago, which is using DNS mask instead of DHCPD. Yes. OpenBSD is DHCPD. And it, it didn't just work like a charm. It, it worked perfectly as a, as a, as a DHCP server for the, for, the, for, the, for the jails. It also did automatically do the name recognition. So like I would, because because the DHCP server knows the host name of the jails, I could like ping the host name of a jail. That was cool. But what more cool was is if you have two servers of two hosts, I would say, and they have their own um, uh, host names, uh, let's say SRV0 and SRV1. And the jails would be, let's say, jail0.srv0 and jail0.srv1. Right, you could point them to each other, and now a jail on a one host would know the IP address of a jail of another host over DNS. It, it was very easy to set up. I will blog mm. about it, and it was very much uh, interesting to see the 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 setup process. It's it's documented beautifully. Of course, it's not BSDL; it's still GPL, as far as I remember. But you know, it's 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 pretty good. Um, it was easier than setting up bind and doing a zone forwarding. Exactly, okay. and you can do something even neater. You can basically have a subdomain for each host. And then a uh, host name in that subdomain for each jail. And then you yes. don't even have to sync the host files, if, which is effectively what the configuration is at that yes. point. But you can just point them at each other or potentially have a parent zone which knows all your servers so that you only change that zone file. Um, yes. And uh, dynamically. The... <laughs> The 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 uh, the fascinating part with this setup was if if one of the tools that I created was called Jailer CTL, where you could mm -hmm. you know con connect from a client to a Jailer server, if that even makes sense. Uh, but let's say now you have ten clients, right? You have Alpha, Beta, Charlie, and all of them are configured properly. I was thinking something like this. Um, uh, where it, someone would do uh, I don't know Jailer CTL cluster. You know, and mm -hmm. it would look into all of your remotes, Alpha, Beta, Charlie, connect them, connect them automatically to each other. Let's say over WireGuard, or in my case, actually, I use the GRE interface, and uh, point all of their DNS masks into each other. Uh, that could have been a very nice way to create a cluster. You know, like vSphere um, style. So, given that you are willing to put some logic into Jailer CTL. Uh, or the jailer backend it talks to you could also basically use the client to just tell jailer ctl to sync the host files by downloading them all sorting them and then pushing them back to all known uh jailer nodes and there would be a ssh force command or just a sub command in jailer uh, yes. which would then filter basically and install only those which do not conflict with the locally running jails Yes. Well, thereby you would have something like Jailer CTL sync names or something or sync uh, sync then, hosts. Yep. Yeah, and then it would you could have if you have some kind of forking trigger whatever mechanism you could do that or you could have potentially one running on the servers of themselves so that they run some kind of fork on change mm -hmm. similar to a DHCP uh, client like DHCP CD where you run hook scripts when things change. Yes. And then you, you could have a default sync hook which would run then the jailer uh, 
whatever a designated user, which is allowed to run some subset of GL commands or whatever. It would also be nice to do it with BGP as well, by the way. You know, like cluster mm. BGP and then just make BGP. BGP is not really the, the tool of choice to sync names. Of course, you can extend it yet again. Uh, but yeah, it's designed to sync network and we're not really name based routing, but hey, could be done. <laughs> I think uh, the less painful way would be something like MQTT. And then my recommendation would be instead of having the mystical, magical, perfectly reliable, hard state mechanism, just run two or three of them and use them as a replication with the form of cache and multicast mechanism and not as a perfectly mm -hmm. reliable interface. And then you would just subscribe to the ones and make sure to fight for the names you care for. Okay. Did we solve all the world's problems? Some of them. Mm. Better than nothing. Except oh. I still can't get IPv6 at home. I tried to follow the instructions, but now all of my addresses are Beef Cafe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you try, Daniel? That said, gentlemen, uh, like and Subscribe. Thank you. Okay, let's call it good there. I, we can stick around and dig even deeper, but have a great one, everyone. Maybe see some of you tomorrow. See ya. Thank you, folks. Cheers. Bye.